So human sensory systems as well as the brain. Generally, we'll be talking about the humans, but also the uh, the uh, examples or samples which you see would be a sheep brain and then cow eye. And once again, you will have a cow eye virtual dissection in the um, connect. So let's kind of go over the pre-lab questions. Name the three layers of the skin. Why are we talking about the skin when we're discussing the sensory systems? Because this is where a lot of sensors located. And three layers will be epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. So epi on top of the dermis, dermis itself, and below the uh, dermis, hypodermis. What is the difference between eyes of insects and invertebrates? Eyes of insects are something which is known as a compound eyes. They're made out of tiny little bitty simple eyes. Each one of them will be sending the signal to the brain and the brain will combine it into a same picture. So let's say in the, and we'll talk about that a little bit during the lab 15 or whatever we're covering the arthropod. Mm. They have a compound eye, so the eye of, let's say, a dragonfly contains 40,000 or so of those particular tiny little bitty, uh, tiny little bitty eyes, each one of them independently sending the signal to the brain. In this particular case, uh, in our particular eye, we have tons of sensors, but we have one eye, compound versus, uh, versus single lens eye. Which layer an eye of an eye contain photoreceptors that would be retina? Same as the uh, uh, same as the um, name of the uh, MacBook Pro line, right? Retina, the high definition one. What is the blind? Yeah, several students reported that they had the uh, internet problems. Yeah, well, it happens. Uh, if you run a little bit late, I, I had to restart my computer in the beginning of the lecture as well. So thank you for letting me know. So uh, what is the blind spot in the eye? Blind spot is this is where the nerves coming out from the brain, basically the optical nerves coming out spreads out so wherever it's spreading out to get information from the receptors so that particular opening where the nerves coming into the retina this is where no photoreceptors no photoreceptors it's a literally a blind spot so we have a blind spot but right next to it we'll have something which is known as a high definition part macula lutea and this one is this is basically the area where we have the highest amount of photolight sensors. As a result, that's our high definition part of the eye. Uh, as a result, uh, that's kind of blocking. That's why we don't really have a hole whenever we are seeing, uh, like even with one eye, we don't see that. We don't really see the black, well, the uh, black, uh, kind of in the middle of the black dot because of the, um, of the blind spot being kind of masked. What's really interesting about and not everybody realizing that our photoreceptors, this is the eyes, right? Our photoreceptors are not facing the uh, incoming light. They're facing the opposite way. They're facing backwards, which makes our eyes not extremely efficient comparatively to, let's say, the eye of the, uh, of the cephalopod. So our light receptors facing backwards. That's why we have those particular nerves coming out from the front. And that's why the nerves have to come out and we have that blind spot. If they would be facing forward, the, uh, well, the, the nerves would come uh, from the back and therefore there will be no blind spot. Anyway, uh, where in the skin? Remember three layers, epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis, you will find it in the dermis. Most of the receptors will be located in the dermis. What part of the eye is changed during LASIK surgery? That would be the lens. Lens 
uh, we have a, a structure which can change its shape. They, they, they're making stuff in focus. So this is what uh, would be cut off a little bit. Well, of course, cornea will be cut cut open to get to the uh, to the lens and then lens will be sh shaved off a little bit and then the cornea will be placed back. Which part of brain is the hind brain? Well, we talk about that. That would be cerebellum, medulla, and pons. Medulla oblongata, if you wish. Uh, what main function of the midbrain? Uh, that would be the relay station. It relays the signals to either higher or lower brain. Which brain controls emotion? Well, depending which one, basically hypothalamus, partially, and our cere uh, cerebral cortex also uh, responsible for that. So midbrain, front brain, or midbrain? Midbrain, typically. So now the uh, table number one showing you the picture of the skin. In the different parts of the body, you can see this is a scalp, this is the armpit, and the one with a very thick layer of epidermis is the uh, sole of the foot. So a very top layer known as the epidermis, and epidermis is essentially made out of some of the light cells, like kind of pinkish, I guess, beige -ish. and then the, uh, the, the, the layer of the dead skin. So that one is the... So we have the living cells, a layer of living cells, which later on dying off, creating multicellular layers of the dead cells, which was surround the shading constantly. We talked and discussed that. So that's the part known as the epidermis. Then we have a majority of the skin. This is the dermis, and this is where most of the structures will be located in such as receptors. So you see that particular yellow stuff, yellow things are neurons, axons essentially, or dendrites. Neurons are part of the neuron and they will be attaching themselves to some sort of structures. Those structures are receptors. We're not going to figure it out which one is the pressure receptors, which one the pain receptors. If you'll see on the lab practical arrow pointing to that, you just say receptor, I'll accept the answer. Okay, that's the receptor two, that's the receptor. Uh, I think and there will be another picture which is also showing several receptors. Also, it will have something which known as a hair shaft. This is where the hair is located. And the, at the very bottom, something which known as a hair follicle. Essentially, this is the cell which producing that particular protein structure the hair. And then, of course, it will have a sebaceous gland, which producing oil to moisturize the, uh, to oil up essentially the uh, hair as well as the skin. It's very important to make skin less water permeable, of course. And then we have a sweat glands, which producing sweat to cool us uh, efficiently. And then we have a hypodermis, Hypodermis is this is where we'll have a, a fat tissue that helps us with the uh, thermal regulation as well. And those red and blue lines and dots are basically the arteries or oxygen carrying uh, capillaries and the deoxygenated blood carrying capillaries. Again, arteries and veins. Guys, what did they tell you? Direction nothing really much to do about what kind of blood is there. Direction, away from the heart artery, toward the heart vein, done. Don't start mixing in oxygenated blood. There is a pulmonary veins which carries oxygenated blood. There is a pulmonary arteries which carries deoxygenated blood. So don't hook yourself on the oxygenated, deoxygenated. Arteries, blood vessels taking blood away from the heart, veins, Blood vessels taking the blood toward the heart. Done. That's it. That's that's pretty much all I'm looking for. Some students start. Highly oxygenated blood goes through the arteries. Well, not pulmonary ones. And we have several of them. Pulmonary trunk, large, one of the largest arteries we have. Deoxygenated blood. 
don't give me the, I don't care about oxygenated, deoxygenated. Typically, yes, if you'll say typically carries oxygenated blood, typically carries deoxygenated blood, I'm okay. But statement oxygenated blood in the arteries, wrong. Statement deoxygenated blood in the vein, wrong as well. Direction, direction. Away from the heart artery, toward the heart vein, done. Maybe on the lap practical too, as a bonus question. Anyway, let's see what do we need to label. We need to label epidermis, deep, dermis, deep, hypodermis, subcutaneous, same thing. Uh, deep, hair shaft, yes, hair follicle, deep, that. Uh, oh, erector pili muscle. See that particular thingy? That's the pili muscle, which will erect the hair. For us, it's not very important, but for many of the animals, Whenever they like, for example, scared, right? Or whenever they are encountering something, they will try to show up a little bit bigger. The, the, the hair stands up. My, uh, my dog periodically, whenever she sees somebody coming in in her backyard, she will uh, raise her hair, especially on the back, looking big, trying to bark, etc. Same thing with the cat. Whenever the cat is kind of scared, or spooked, like puff up. Plus, of course, that helps them with the uh, thermoregulation. Whenever it's really cold, they'll puff up. Those muscles will uh, contract. The hair will go up. As a result, they'll have a bigger insulation layer. Uh, sensory receptors talk about that adipose tissue, the yellow stuff right here. That's the adipose one, sebaceous gland and blood vessels. Sebaceous gland and the blood vessels, all that particular red and blue color thing. What is the function of erector pili muscles to raise up the hair? Uh, to either show bigger or for uh, insulation, better insulation. What is the function of uh, sebaceous gland? Produce sebum. <laughs> oh, that's for real. Uh, to produce sebum. Sebum is essentially fat, oil, which will help uh, moisturize, so to speak, the skin. So under production of sebum, you will have that particular very, uh, very dry skin, which might start breaking apart, etc. Sebum, the fat essentially moisturizing, moisturizing the skin. That's why if you'll have any kind of moisturizing uh, lotions or creams, you will, it, it, it will be based on some sort of butter, like cocoa butter or shea butter or anything like that. Substitution. All right, now next one, we're going into the structure of scalp. Yeah, we throw a look at that. So here we have some of the other soul region. So here we have the model where it actually tells you or showing you where each one of them, sebaceous gland, the sweat gland, the subcutaneous fat tissues, the blood vessels, the probably that's most likely a pressure receptors. Those ones most likely the pain receptors. But once again, don't have to worry much about those. So now the eye, the model of the eye. The model of the eye, in the eye you will see uh, several major structures and let's see the white stuff surrounding the eye, that's known as a sclera. Uh, choroid is the layer below or under the sclera. It's very, very thin, kind of reddish looking one right here. Uh, kind of hard to point it out. I doubt it will be, yes, uh, the question was, so the uh, erector pili muscle will raise the hair when we'll have a goosebumps. Yes, that's exactly it. So now going back to the eye. So choroid, a relatively thin layer, kind of hard to point it out. Doubt it will be on the lab practical. If it will be, blame everything on me. I'll give you one extra point. Easy. So, but the cornea, cornea is the front part, which is, uh, which uh, allow the light to go through. It's uh, tra uh, transparent. And basically, if you, whenever you're putting the, if you are putting contact lenses, you're putting it on top of the cornea. Then the iris, that particular brown structure inside, I'll show you the close up. And then the pupil, the 
opening where the light goes through and it goes back to the retina that particular orange part right here it's all con contain all of those particular light receptors uh, vitreous humor the eye is not empty it's filled up with the liquidish gelatinous uh, li well gelatinous liquid and that known as a vitreous humor and this particular a plastic ball or plastic uh, sphere uh, represents that particular vitreous humor. A blind spot, this particular part right here, this is where the nerve, optical nerve comes to the eye, sending the nerves to, set, to get the information from the set receptors. So that's the, uh, that particular, and right next to it, you will have a macular lutea. As a matter of fact, if you look right here, you can see a tiny little bit yellow spot. That's the macula lutea. Humans don't have a very large macula lutea, but this is the highest, well, this is the area of the eye with the highest uh, concentration of the uh, photoreceptors. You might heard that some of the, like, uh, let's say, hawks, they can see that tiny little bitty mouse running in the, uh, in the grass uh 300 uh, thousand feet uh, from, from, from here can you see that no you cannot why the hawk can and we cannot just because they can zoom it in no they cannot zoom it in they have a better zooming abilities no once again they don't have a zooming abilities they have a very large macula lutea meaning they have a very large high definition area so whenever they're looking they start seeing that particular mouse running when you with well, us me too uh, don't really see it because our eye doesn't have that high definition uh area all right so macular lutea lacrimal gland is our this guy right here the structure is producing the liquid uh surrounding the eye and then inside the eye too so here we have the vitreous body, the cornea, and then I think I have a better slide. So here we have, I removed the part. So cornea, the outer uh, clear part, the pupil is the opening where the light goes through and then the iris usually uh, changing, the, uh, changing the size so it can allow too much whenever it's open or closed down. That's basically a diaphragm and also uh, gives us the eye color. So if you have a brown, that you have a brown eye. Uh, I have a bluish grayish colored eye. Then my iris is the bluish grayish blue officially. So that's, I think that's, yeah. So here we have cornea pupil lens, right now. Yeah, lens, uh, it was kind of hard to see it, but lens is allocated behind the iris. And this is what the lazy, uh, operation would be adjusting or changing. So here we have retina, all of that orange, that particular kind of brownish reddish layer, that's a choroid and the white stuff is the square of course, and then macula lutea, and this is where the optical nerve gets into the eye. So blind spot, it's blind because we don't have any uh, sensors there, light sensors. All right, well, the brain part. In the brain, on the exterior, you'll have to find the cerebellum, cerebral hemisphere, olfactory bulbs, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, and the cranial nerves. All right, very easy stuff. So let's kind of take a look on, the, on this part. So this is the external part and the hemispheres, right? The larger ones on the side, so those ones are nice. So that would be the uh, hemispheres. That brown structure on the side kind of look right here, that structure, that's the cerebellum. Remember coordination of the movement. Now the first pair of cranial nerve will create those bulbs, right? Kind of sticking right here. That's the olfactory, olfactory of the smelling bulbs. And you see they're not cross-secting. So the whatever is you're smelling with your right, uh, right nostril will go into your right part of the brain. Whatever you'll smell with your left nostril will go in the left part of the brain. 
that part right here that's cut out, but there will be optical nerves and the eyes are right here. So optical nerve goes from one, uh, one eye and the other eye. And then that would be the optical nerves. Optical nerves cross-secting. See? Optical nerve number one, optical nerve number two. And in this case, it's called optical chiasm. The merging. That's the second pair of what? Cranial nerves. The nerves coming out straight from the brain. There is quite a few of those. Again, there is 12 pairs. First pair is a, a olfactory, second pair are optical. And they are labeled right here as well. So those are optical, uh, not optical, cranial nerves. So this part, this is the nerves endings. They go throughout generally head and the neck, but also some of them moving further down the body. Um, so yeah. We covered that relatively, relatively easy. Done. Now, longitudinal section. That's a pineal gland right here. Not in, in this part. So here we have the cross section. Again, cerebral uh, front, cerebral hemisphere. That structure known as the corpus callosum. It's connection between two hemispheres, right? Then you will need to put the medulla, that part, the D part, kind of the medulla oblongata. E would be the pons. Then B would be the cerebellum. Within the cerebellum, you see that particular kind of tree-looking structure called arbor vitae. Vitae, of course, life. Arbor means arboretum. Arbor is tree, tree of life. It's basically the structure within the uh, cerebellum. I think you have a similar, yeah, there we go. So pons, medulla, uh, thalamus, and then there will be a hypothalamus, corpus callosum. Uh, what else do you need here? Gray matter and white matter. You don't really see it here, but I'll show you on the actual brain. And lateral ventricle. Oh, here we go. Lateral ventricle is very important part. This is where remember that our spinal cord has the oh well, it's a hollow. It has the channel where the cerebral spinal fluid goes in and bathing. There are the several uh, several ventricles within the brain. So lateral ventricle. I'll show you on the, on the actual brain. It's much easier to see it there. But this is where the cerebral spinal fluid uh, circulates. So here we have a cerebral hemispheres, and again, optical. Well, this is basically showing you the 12 pair of nerves. Number one, number two, uh, then uh, uh, that's number 12. So yes, all of those are showing you the optical nerves. Now let's take a look at the cross section. Again, cerebellum, medulla oblongata, pons, and that kind of whole a cavity, that complete cavity, that the uh, that the uh, ventricle lateral ventricle now if you look on top and i think i have a little bit better slide right there but in this case uh, let's take a look i think here we go uh the cross section of the brain you can see the corpus callosum come uh keeping in contact two of those hemispheres but look at this particular part Right here, we'll have a darker kind of pinkish grayish color. That's the gray matter. And then in the middle, we have the white matter. OK, white matter. And of course, in the, uh, in the spinal cord, white matter is the outside and the gray matter is inside. And here we have a brain with the different areas. But again, you can clearly see the medulla, the pons, the part of the midbrain cerebellum, cerebrum, of course, and then the lateral ventricle. See that right here. The lateral ventricle, which is essentially located almost underneath of the corpus callosum. So here again, lateral ventricle clearly seen as the cavity. And also you can see the gray matter and the white matter. Now, 
And I think we are pretty much done with that part. Let's kind of take a look on the cow eye. And you will be doing the, um, you will be doing the uh, virtual dissection of the cow eye, but there is a couple of things which you need to kind of make sure that you know. Uh, let's take a look. Sclera, you should be able to uh, to name the sclera on the eye, and this is the white stuff right here. That's the sclera, right? Caroid is kind of hard to see, so don't worry about that. I once again doubt that it will be on the lab practical. Retina, the back of the eye. But the cow eye also has that particular iridescent layer. Iridescent layer known as the tapetum lucidum. Lucium lucius shiny. Lucifer, right? The shiny one. Uh, uh, so in this particular case, tapetum, tapetum means a layer or uh, cape, essentially, shiny layer. So shiny layer, some of the animals, not us, but some of the animals like cows, as well as like, let's say, cats, they have a tapetum lucidum. Uh, which was basically shiny layers. It allows them to see better in the dark, uh, in the dark, because that one will uh, shine the light, the additional light, which is in the eye, back into the light sensor. So they have a better night vision. The cow has a better night vision than us. So, but they, they don't have the much of the color sensors and we have a better color vision. We do have a better uh, color vision. They don't really, they kind of have a sepia kind of brownish color, everything uh, surrounding along with the dog and cat. So in this particular case, uh, sclera, yes, retina, please, no, cornea. Uh, cornea is basically, well, I'll, I'll show you the better pictures, but cornea is the top. This, this is cornea right here. That, that would be the cornea. Then tapetum lucidum, that particular shiny layer on the back of the eye. Uh, pupil is the opening right there. The lens is that part right here. What else do you need to see? You will not be able to see the vitreous humerus. It's again gelatin mass, which is kind of splashes around. Optic nerve on the back, you can clearly see. I'll, I'll show you the different picture. A uh, blind spot is kind of hard to see, as well as the macular lutea on the model, the cremal gland on the model. Blind spot is also on the model you should be able to see. So here we have the cornea, the sclera, here we have the lens. That's the, uh, of course, the cornea removed from that particular eye. And then we're looking at the shiny layer is the tapetum lucidum. And then we have the, on the back there, we have a retina. And then that one is the actual optical nerve, but they better see, yeah, then the optical nerve is right here. So if it's not clearly visible, it would be kind of hard to, to point it out. So again, probably will not be on a, on a lab practical. Once again, so far we're doing really good and I, I don't think I asked any tricky questions. So if I cannot see it, if I cannot identify it very easy, I would not put it there. So now the brain, uh, the questions, yeah, draw, you can take a picture or print screen. Probably that one would contain most of the Oh, that one, yeah, that probably picture will be containing most of the information, a couple of pictures, print screen it, that's fine. And then what uh, surprised you most when you open the cow eye? Oh, also look for the same structures when you will do the virtual dissection itself. Uh, so yeah, and then answer whatever uh, the surprise you the most. Many of the students, uh, whenever you're doing the actual, actual, dissection saying that it's really hard and yes you have to really cut into that and then the tapetum lucidum is also another very interesting layer because the uh, it's, it's very shiny so uh, the brain the sheep brain we have it right here and basically 
basically you can see the cerebellum, you can see the arbor vitae, you can see the olfactory bulbs, right? The first pair of cranial nerves. You will see the optical nerve and the chiasm. I think seven is the chiasm. This is where the cross section of the uh, nerves coming in. That's why the information from the right eye will end up in the left side of the brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, you can see the meninges. Uh, brain is surrounded by a special layers known as the meninges. Uh, what else we see? Well, you can see the uh, cerebral hemisphere, of course. And let's see what we have here. And uh, here you can see the part of the ventricle. That particular cavity right here is the ventricle. Olfactory bulbs, chiasm, that's the optical nerve, chiasm, optical nerve, uh, gray matter, white matter. Well, you clearly can see that part uh, on the on the other slides. Yes, this one is not really showing much. What else? I mean, thalamus, kind of hard to identify, but it will be under. Well, corpus callosum, you should be able to recognize. Uh, corpus callosum is right here, thalamus right there, and the ventricle will be right here. So, pa, 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 pa. on the picture, on this particular picture, those particular pictures, whoops, sorry guys, let me pull that one out again. I was playing to increase. So let's kind of take a look on those pictures. So here, what do you see? Uh, you see the optical uh, olfactory bulb right here. This is the olfactory bulb. That's the optical nerve. Optical nerve goes from the eye to the eye, cross-secting, and that would be the optical chiasm, a cerebral, a cerebral hemisphere, cerebellum. Uh, let's see, corpus callosum is that particular structure alone. Here we have a structure. Here we have a lateral ventricle, thalamus, that would be pons, that would be medulla oblongata. And on this particular picture, you can clearly see the white versus gray map. I think we covered pretty much everything. Which part of the eye show the color of the eye? That would be the iris. What is the aperture that light goes through uh, that the pupil, uh, which layer contains photoreceptors retina, which part of the brain control the high function that the cerebral hemispheres, which organ of the body process information collected by the sensory organs brain, which part of the brain basic uh, maintain basic homeostasis of the body, pons and medulla hind brain. Uh, essentially, uh, or pre, or it's, it's called the lizard brain. I sometimes refer to the fish brain too, but it's a hind brain. Uh, medulla oblongata and the pond specifically. What is the a function of tapetum lucidum? Reflect the light back into the retina. Do they, as human I have a tapetum? We don't have that. And the main purpose, and yes, there are our favorite reflection questions. We are done with the lab. Now, it's, it was also kind of part of the review. Let me pull it out really quickly, the review. Open. There we go. All of you should have that particular review posted, right? Everybody seen that? Hopefully, once again. And after doing that. So let me pull it out really quickly. The lab number 16, tissues, bones, and muscles. And we have it right here. Okay, hold on.
Так. Right. Do it again. Human body. This one right here. All right. So let's kind of take a look on the first set of questions from lab number 16. We already did it. Everything should be just fine. You shouldn't have much of the problem on that one. It's straightforward. Four types of the uh, tissues would be epithelial connective nervous and muscular or muscular con uh, nervous epithelial tissue. Simple squamous. In the squamous, the thighs are about, well, the, the lengths are about the same as the uh, width, but the height will be relatively small. And we're looking at the cheek cells. In the cheek cell, you can clearly see the outline of the cheek cell, which will be cell membrane. You can clearly see the darker spot, which is a nucleus. And everything, uh, everything between the nucleus and the cell membrane is the cytoplasm. Uh, now, simple. Where do you find simple squamous epithelium in the body? Well, cheek cells, right? So in the mouth, many of the skin epithelial surfaces, many of them will contain that. Uh, then we're going into a columnar epithelium, lumen, lumen in your. Uh, in your lab, it was said linen. That was a mis mi mistake, mi a typo. Uh, I am you right next to it, but it's a lumen. It's the inside of the tube, of the digestive tube. But here you'll see the V li, right, which is drastically increasing the surface area for digestion and absorption. And then if you go closer, you will start seeing the cells. You can see the outline, the nucleus, the goblet cell uh, containing mucus, which will be released into the um, uh, into the lumen, what is the function of this? Release the mucus so the food will be sliding down easier. Uh, and then simple cuboidal cells. Here we have some of the examples of simple cuboidal cells under a higher magnification. So cuboidal cells will have basically height, weight, uh, well, height, length, and the uh, with about the same uh, simple one, one layer of the cell, and we can find it where in the kidney, uh, in the kidney cu uh, tubules. Muscular cells on the muscular tissue will see the skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles will have a very, very distinct striations. You can clearly see those particular striations right here as well as right there. If there will be a question regarding that, I'll double check that it shows the striations and you will see tons of different tiny little big nuclei because they multi-nucleated cells. Now, smooth muscles, whenever you go into a smooth muscles, very similar, but you don't really see those particular striations. So, and then in the cardiac muscle, what you will see is the faint striations as well, but also you will see those dark lines across the cell. And now those ones are known as the intersolated discs. Uh, nucleate or enucleate. So uh, skeletal muscles voluntarily, we can contract them. Smooth muscles are not, and the cardiac muscles are not voluntarily. Now on the connective tissue, so we're talking about the adipose tissue. Let me pull out the adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is here. So you can see kind of nice and round fat cells. And you can see that the nucleus will be pushed down toward the cell membrane, not cell wall, cell membrane. Animals don't have cell walls. Now, cartilage, well, we should have a blood too, right? Yeah, there will be blood. So cartilage, no, that's the blood, that's the fat. Here we have a cartilage. Cartilage uh, cells, uh, you can clearly see the cells themselves, the purple, dark purple spot. That's the chondriocyte, the, uh, the place where it's located and known as a lacuna. And that like purplish pinkish color is the matrix. Uh, of the cartilage, chondrine, right? Made out of chondrine. So chondrocyte, lacuna, matrix. 
Now, in the bones, whenever you're looking at the bones, let me find that slide. Here we have, this is the slide, and what you will see is something which is known as a central, uh, well, osteon, that particular circle is the osteon with the central canal and the tiny little bit the dark spot, those dark spots known as the osteocytes. Osteocytes are the cell which is making the the bone itself. You can clearly see them on this particular slide. Osteocytes and those particular tiny little bit channels which are osteocytes connected to each other and the central canal known as the caniculi. So identify osteon, the around the central canal. What the central canal has? Blood vessels for sure, sometimes nerves. Uh, but why we need the blood vessels? The cells inside of the bone are still alive. They need nutrients. They need to get rid of the waste. So here we have, they provide them with the, uh, with the nutrients removing the waste caniculi and what else we need to get rid of the matrix. Yeah, all that particular dark gray stuff is the matrix, the uh, bone itself. Blood, blood right here. Uh, wonderful pictures and in this particular case red blood cells right all that particular pink stuff then we have a white blood cells the the one which contain nuclei tiny little big a tiny little big dots purple dots right here are the platelets and everything in between the cells known as the extracellular matrix ecm also known for the blood it's liquid it's known as the plasma and i think we yeah neutrophils well neutrophils it's, it's a type of the red blood cell one of the most common. A skeletal system. Now we start looking at the skeleton. First, we're looking at the structure of the long bone, long bone, the tibia, the femurs, all of those ones. And basically, at the tips of the long bone, we have something which is known as a red bone marrow. Well, first, whenever you look at the structure of the bone, you will see that. There is a two very distinct layers, a compact bone right here, which is kind of covering the bone. This is uh, providing the most uh, structural strength to the bone. And then inside of the bone, we have kind of like a looking like a sponge. So it's spongy. At the tips of the spongy part, we have a red bone marrow, which is the the stem cells for the blood, right? Blood stem cells. And then in the middle of that part, we have the canal, which contains the yellow bone marrow, which is uh, contain high level of fats and also plays some a role in the formation of the or storing of the uh, limb. So spongy bone, compact bone, medullary cavity. What else? region containing yellow bone marrow. Okay, cover that. Which region in the stem cells, the red bone marrow? What is the difference between red and bone, or yellow bone marrow? Uh, well, different function, different location. Know which bones make axial skeleton. So here we have a skeleton axial, the main part, the axis, the skull and the vertebral column. And then the appendicular, would be the appendages naturally and the bones which are appendages attached to the axial skeleton. So uh, pelvic griddle and pectoral griddle. So uh, pectoral griddle, collarbone, also known as the clavicle, and the, show, uh, the, the scapulas, the it's not shoulder bone, well, it is uh, scapula, yes, yeah, shoulder bone, right? So, and then of course the pelvis will be making the pelvic griddle. Uh, identify cervical thoracic lumbar and here we have all that. So the cervical and then we have the thoracic one and then we have the lumbar and then we have the uh, sacral and the, the tail uh, bone, uh, fusion of several bones together. On the muscles, on the muscles, 
uh, male versus female, male will have less than 90 degrees in bones, uh, females will have a larger degree. So here we have the muscle man, so to speak, and then there is a several major muscles which you need to know, the bicep, the tricep, the oblique, uh, the quadricep, the hamstring, the gluteus maximus, so all of those we are covered right and i think they even labeled for you somewhere yes one two three so here we have a bicep here we have a tricep then we have some let's see uh we have bicep so bicep tricep quadricep quadricep right here oh no quadricep is right here quadricep right here that's the hamstring group then we have the oblique and the gluteus maximus, they go exactly in the same order. So bicep, tricep, quadricep, hamstring, oblique, uh, the gluteus maximus, the largest. So now digestive system, and I think that's pretty much it, right? Yes. So next lab is something. Let's so let me pull it out next guide. So 17 digestive system. Well, that's straightforward. I mean, nothing really uh, difficult about this lab. All of them should be just fine as long as you remember. Well, the, the digestive system is very easy one. So let's take a look. Uh, no, the function mouth has teeth basically to do what? To moisturize the food, to grind the food. To break it into a swallow uh, pieces, moisturize so it can be swallowed nicely. Uh, some of the enzymes are already injected with the saliva, and of course, some of the chemicals to kill the bacteria. Esophagus is basically the tube contain, uh, connecting mouth with the stomach. In the stomach, we have starting of the protein digestion and also highly acidic environment to kill most of the bacteria. Small intestine, this is where most of the digestion and absorption occurs. And remember, huge surface area. Pancreas produces digestive enzymes, liver produces a bile, which is stored in the gallbladder, helps with the emulsification of fat. Large intestine stores and moves transports undigested material, contain high level of the uh microorganisms this is where the water getting reabsorbed and some of the vitamins and then of course let's kind of take a look that was a very very simple lab make sure that you know intracellular extracellular digestion and also here we have the uh this this one we have of course the gorgeous edibles look for that one so here we have the ascending part, transverse and descending part of the large intestine. And for the duodenum, duodenum ileum, the duodenum part is basically where you have the stomach connecting to the small intestine. That's the duodenum, most of it is duodenum, and ileum is the part where the large intestine connected to the small intestine. Uh, Like I said, easy. Uh, let's go to the next one, which was a cardiac and the respiratory. Again, not too much. There is a few structures which you need to remember. And please remember the evolution. By the evolution, we're talking about how many, uh, how many chambers a different group of the organisms have. So in this particular case, external and internal part. We're talking about the right, left atrium, right, left ventricle, atrium, right, atrium on either side, ventricles will be on the bottom side, apex, the aorta or aortic arch, because as you can see, it's arching out. That would be uh, one of the largest arteries we have, known as the pulmonary trunk, yet it's, uh, uh, it's painted blue. Why? Because it carries deoxygenated blood but it carries away from the heart, so it is what? Artery. 
And then, of course, we're looking at the uh, different structures. Make sure you'll remember the tricopsis versus bicopsis, and then the semilunar valves, where they are located under the right and the left uh, valves. What is the function of the coronary arteries and coronary veins, and where are they are located? Those particular veins and arteries, which is supplying the uh, nutrients and taking the waste away from the heart. So they're supplying the nutrients and taking away uh, waste directly from the heart muscle. So now I fill the chart uh, chambers below. So here we have the structures so where there is a couple of models, atrium ventricle for the fish, so two chambers. Amphibians will have two atriums now, uh, right and left the oxygenated oxygenated blood and then it mixes up in the middle because it does not have the separation yet that one uh this is the amphibian one the other one so uh, there is no separation yet so mixed blood that's why you can see that it's coming out kind of purplish color uh so not a very effective but they already have a lung so two circles of the uh, circulation, the systemic and the pulmonary. Uh, ta, 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 ta. Reptiles will have kind of three and a half. The separation is partial, even though blood is mixed up. In the ventricles, it's more effective. And the higher reptiles, the birds as well as the uh, later on mammals, will have a four-chamber heart. A representative organism no, uh, open or closed. So open versus closed to circulatory system. You'll see most of the invertebrates will have the open circulatory system. Closed circulatory system. Vertebrate, the mollusk, cephalopod only. You'll see a snail that's open circulatory system. The cephalopod, squid, octopus, nautilus, those ones have a closed circulatory system and the earthworm. Earthworm or the marine worms, which we were talking about, the segmented worm, uh, which is they have a closed circulatory system. Uh, now, the respiratory system, respiratory system, make sure you will be able to identify that this is the lung, this is the trachea. Uh, on the model, you should be able to say the, the, the clear dome is thoracic cavity, the red uh, balloons are the lungs. And then the uh, the uh, rubber membrane is basically a diaphragm. Uh, now let's take a look on the model. On the model, you should be able to recognize the epiglottis, what the function to close down, what right here whenever you're swallowing the food or drinking. Now on the model, you should be able to. Uh, recognize lung, trachea, bronchi, alveoli, capillary bed, and what gases will be exchanged. Carbon dioxide goes out, oxygen goes in. What is the function of the larynx? Voice box. Identify plaque in the artery, so disease in coronary arteries, coronary veins, so coronary arteries, coronary veins right on the heart, heart, lung, and the plaque. Here we have the yellow spot right there, that's all the plaque. As you can see, drastically decreasing the size of the artery. So less blood will be coming out and at a higher pressure. What disease condition accumulation of the plaque? Arteriosclerosis. Fetal peak dissection. Uh, basically, most of you did fairly good. I looked through the labs. Most of you did very good. Keep in mind those particular 15-ish internal structures, trachea, trachea, lung, heart, diaphragm. Then we're talking about the stomach, pancreas, uh, spleen, small intestine, large intestine, then we're looking at the kidneys, the sex of the baby, or the, the, uh, the, the liver, of course, the gallbladder, uh, what else? Well, larynx, that's on top of the trachea. 
that's 14. I think there is something else I'm missing. Ah, kidneys, and from the kidneys, there will be kind of the structures which taking the urine down into urinary bladder ureter. So that's pretty much it, what you need to be able to recognize. Sex typically is the common. You will see the tapes, that word that means that the male, you see the uterine force and the abdominal the lower part of the abdominal part, that would be the T, a male. Now, number 20, excretory and reproductive. Did that? So, excretory on the kidney. Make sure that you recognize the cortex of the kidney, the medulla of the kidney, the outer part, the middle part, and then the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis merge into a ureter. There is two blo major blood vessels coming into each kidney. The bright red one, the renal artery, and the blue one, the renal vein. <clears throat> on the on the structure of the uh, nephron, be able to recognize glomerulus, glomerul or Bowman capsule, distal. Uh, uh, distal, uh, so glomerulus, Bowman capsule, or glomerul capsule, proximal convoluted tube, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tube, and then the collecting duct. So renal artery, renal vein, let me see what else do we have here. Renal artery, vein, ureter, renal pelvis, renal medulla, renal cortex, nephron, the whole thing. Glomerul, Bowman capsule, proximal convoluted, loop of Henry, distal collecting, and the glomerul capillaries. All of that are here. We're looking at the picture of the Bowman capsule surrounding the ball of capillaries. There we go, glomerul. A reproductive. Uh, structures, no sexual, asexual, reproductive parts, right? And then whenever you're looking at the female, what do we need to be able to recognize? So in a uh, female ovary, uterus, oviduct. So ovary right here, that's the oviduct, also known as the uterine horn, which is leading to the uh, to the uterus. Uterus is a place where the baby is developing. Uh, here we have the vagina and the cervix. Uh, cervix, well, basically at the very uh, end of that structure, which is basically a female organ of copulation. Uh, urinary bladder, this is where the ureter comes in from the kidney, the urethra. Urinary bladder, which is not really a part of the reproductive system, but you. Uh, name there, uh, ureter, rectum, uh, and anus, rectum, and anus, anus yes, uh, also not a part of the reproductive system. Uh, what structure called the grown uh, fetus that would be a uh, <clears throat> uterus? What is the function of the corpus luteum? Corpus luteum producing the hormones to prepare uterus to accepting the uh, embryo. On the ovarian model, here we have the ovary. ovaries, a cross section of the ovaries. We have the primary follicle, right? Secondary follicle, primary oocyte, secondary, uh, uh, primary, primary oocyte, secondary follicle. That's the secondary uh, follicle. So primary. A secondary follicle, graphene follicle, the cell which will be released the egg into the oviduct, and then the graphene a follicle collapses, creating the corpus luteum. So now on the male, so here we have the oviduct, the ovaries, the egg uh, release goes into the oviduct, from the oviduct and up in the uterus, and here we have vagina and so. Uh, now, on the male structures, on the male structures, here we have the, let me see, that one. So, what we need to, so, testis, right, testis, epididymus. Then we have the vas deferens, which goes through the prostate gland, prostate gland and uterus, 
uh, urethra will merge there. So through the urethra, through the penis, uh, out into the wild, so to speak. So penis is the organ of copulation. And now asexual, sexual for representative organ. And we're talking about can the uh, starfish do sexual reproduction? Yes, it has the gonad right here. Uh, egg sexual reproduction, larvae, all that particular good stuff, don't have to worry about that. But asexual fragmentation, the hydra sexual uh, gonads right here goes through the sexual reproduction, don't have to worry much about that. But the special type of asexual reproduction are the bugs. A tiny little big polyp, so body. And the sexual reproduction, the main idea behind the sexual reproduction is genetic variance. And sensory systems and brain, we just covered that. I don't think we need to go over that function of the erector pili to uh, raise up the hair, sebaceous gland produce the uh, oils for moisturizing skin or waterproofing skin and hair where the skin can find the receptor spin pressure dermis uh sclera choroid don't have to worry about the choroid retina for sure cornea iris pupil vitreous tumor blind spot and black remnant gland this layer contains what the receptors that would be retina what is a blind spot this is where the nerve enters the eye the optical nerve dissected tapetum tapetum is quite common in the question on the test because you can clearly see the bright shiny. Identify external features, cerebellum, cerebral hemisphere, olfactory. We, we did all of that. Which part of the brain maintain basic homeostasis, high and brand, middle and pons, control high function at the brain. So we are pretty much done for today. If you have any questions, any problems, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you for joining. And I'll see you Thursday for the last uh, lab practical exam. I think all the lecture exams are graded. I'll double check and I will drop all, drop one grade. So, well, thank you guys. See you Thursday.